welcome back. As I said, my name is Nanan Sakwal. Now, with me in the studio as a dynamo. <laughs> She's an old girl of Wesley Girls High School, Cape Coast, Ghana Institute of Journalism, an alumni of the University of Leeds. Now, that's a good one in the UK. Practicing a practice in media and communication. She's been in this industry for the past 16 years, 12 of which she has uh, worked as a news anchor and a presenter. She rose through the ranks and became the general manager for news and sports, having held several positions, including the foreign desk at TV3. She became a household name and a mentor for many aspiring journalists. She is currently an asset and I insist, an asset with the multimedia group, occupying position as uh, the managing news editor for the Joy News uh, TV on multi-TV. Her name is no other than M. M. Morrison. I'm not even going to say M. Morrison. <laughs> now, I found that out. Now, you don't normally say M. Morrison, you say M. Morrison. Welcome to your own studio, Eva. Thank you, Lana. <laughs> Emma, my first question is, can you make a good tour Zafi? Um, no. Emma, that's a ministerial position <laughs> lost there. I've never <laughs> tried before. I've never tried to make TZ before. That, that's a ministerial... But I'm sure that if I did try, I'll make a wonderful... You will learn on the job. Yes, I can do that. Okay, that was just a side question. That was just <laughs> my own consumption. But Emma, I want to start with your early life, because you come from a big family, a family of 13 siblings. And I know you had your early childhood also in Dollis Hill, North London. Oh, yes, yes. Were, were, were all 13 siblings in, in London then? Or? I wish, I wish, but no, not all 13 were there. There were three of us there. Um, of course, um, we are 13. And I, lo I like to say that my father um, formed uh, a football team with the girls with two reserves as the boys. So, of course, we're 11 girls and two boys, you know. Wow. Yeah, so it is, it's a huge family. We're n we were not all together, but um, we are very close. Yeah. Uh, would you say there was a competition in the family? For oh, absolutely. I mean, you know, you, you can't have a big family like that and not have a lot of competition going on, you know, and little alliances and clicks here, and then one minute is changing in your favor and you're doing, working out some tricks to, you know, get a lot of them on your side and say, yeah, you know, I, I've done this and I've done that. There were so many, you know, alliances and clicks, you know, within, within the siblings itself. But, you know, we, 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 we found it like a game. It was like a game for us, you know, those of us who could sort of like um, play tricks and, you know, get people aligned to you. Uh, would you say you have a, a good childhood? I, silver spoon? Not silver spoon. No, 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 not silver spoon. But it was a good childhood. Well, I enjoyed it anyway. I mean, I, I, I loved being part of a big family, and um, we always felt cared for and loved, you know. Not silver spoon, definitely not, but it was good. It was good. And what number do you fall within your siblings? I'm number seven. I'm right in the middle. <laughs> <laughs> so there's a contingent in front of you and a contingent <laughs> behind, behind you. Yeah, so I'm safe. I'm right in the middle. When you were growing up in Dollis Hill, you came to Ghana, uh, did you know that, you know what, I'm going to be in the media? Or did you want it to be a, you know, like a lawyer or a doctor and then fate happened in general? Or did you always want to be where you are now? You know, ev ever since, um, you know, come to think of it, thinking back, I sort of knew that this is what I was going to do. I love to read. At a very early age, I could read. And I, I'd love to write little, little things here and there. Ever since I was quite young, I love to write stories and things like that. So I think, yes, deep down, I knew that this is where I was going to go um, when I was very young, yes. Um, up to the time I was about, let's say, 14, 15, then I sort of like, look, look if this is what I'm going to do, I have to really focus on it and do it. So by the time I was 14, 15, I knew I'd be a, a journalist. Emma, you have done a lot, and I remember I was just telling a friend that, oh, I'm uh, sitting in for Steve Ante, and Friday is a personality profile. So I said, oh, who are you interviewing? And I said, oh, I'm interviewing Emma Morrison. She's like, the Emma Morrison? <laughs> and I said, yeah, the Emma Morrison. So I also have the in front of my name So, now. you know, it may, I mean, when you have wow. the the, you know that it's, it's, it's big time. <laughs> I never thought I would have that. <laughs> you know, when you have the the, it's big time. And I looked through your CV, and you achieved a lot in TV3. 
mm. rose through the ranks to you know head the uh, foreign desk and it makes me ask is there more you can achieve or do you think i've finished with this side with media side of my career let me now go somewhere else you know if even though i've been in the media for 16 to 17 years and all that i i still feel that i haven't done enough you know because this is me this is what i love to do and i just feel that there's so much more that i can do um one, once you get bitten by the you know media thing and you're really passionate about what you do sometimes you, you can't even think of doing anything else you know because you dream it you live it then you're, you're there then you, you sort of like start formulating things that oh you know you'd like to do this or that and sometimes you really do love to move on but you know you always keep coming back <laughs> Emma, when you say you know uh, you feel like you haven't done more I just want to let you know that you've done a lot I mean when you met you know the president of Liberia you know you meet presidents across Africa yeah. uh, Bill, uh, Mrs. Clinton yeah you know and not even many people who live in America get to meet Mrs. Clinton mm. so you have done a lot mm. you know you have done a lot and uh, what I don't know how to phrase the question, but what, what would you do to like inspire people to get to where you are or dream to be where you are? I like to do a lot of mentoring of you know the young people. I always tell them that nothing is impossible. If you dream it, you can live it. You know, you dream it and you live it. But you just have to be focused and go for it. You know, there's no way being wishy-washy about it and you're not sure would I should I or shouldn't I want and you know being in the media at the time that we we started out there were there weren't a lot of young ladies or women in there and even when we were there it was like oh they always used to give us the very soft jobs and oh you know oh, just go and do this one but the hard ones always went to to the, to the to the men and I was like why you know we can also do it so I, I love to inspire people that way that you can dream it and then you can live it is all is only that you have to focus on it and know exactly what you want to do and where you want to go and then you just go for it that's that's how I you know I always talk to people about trying to achieve something that they really want to do uh, what I wanted to find out was uh Obviously, when you start in the media, you do the more the front row, maybe like uh -huh. you know, reading in the front or out on the field. Okay. And then as you become a big woman, you now go to the back and then mm. you press pressing the buttons to get uh, people to do it. Which one was more fun for you? Out on the field. <laughs> out on the field. Absolutely. I remember when, when they said, oh, okay, you know, we need producers and all that. So Emma, you know, start producing. I was like, does that mean that I have to leave the field and they were like you know and you know how you know you have to produce and you're busy and you're editing people's stories and you're sitting there. I said oh I just said to myself no I can do both so sometimes I used to um, go out on the field do a story come back and produce the news as well but it's quite hectic and mm -hmm. it's, there's a lot of pressure in the newsroom because you're trying to meet deadlines and timelines and things like that you're pushing people around where's the story do that do that so I said to myself, so I, I got resigned to it. I said, oh, never mind, you know, I can still do something and, you know, make things work and make it real. So then I started enjoying editing people's stories, telling them what they should add to it or take out, you know, they need to do more research on that, you know, be creative about it. How do you present it to people, mm -hmm. you know, and I also started enjoying that as well. But then I must tell you that I still really miss being out on the field all the time. Because it's, it's something else. There's a lot going on out there. Mm -hmm. uh, you get new experiences all the time. You know, you get to meet people because you're a communicator. There's, a, there's always, you know, you need to feel what is going on out there. You know, you need to be there to feel it. Why do people like working for you? I did a little investigation. <laughs> and somehow, when you are in an office or in an area, the people around you like to work for you. So I was thinking that, well, make your work easy. I mean, you've worked hard to attain that, but once you're there, everybody wants to work for you. I don't know. Maybe I'm nice. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. But I, I believe in um, telling it as it is. You know, I'm, I'm very nice, but when it gets down to doing the work, you know, you have to work. But I also don't believe in if somebody, for instance, if a reporter writes a story, there's no use just looking at it and throwing it out. Tell them what is wrong with it. Take mm -hmm. them through. 
you know, show them what they could do and what else they can achieve, you see. So once you do that, and because I worked in television for a long time, sometimes people will come up with different kinds of um, visuals or pictures or something, but they don't represent the story properly. So when you take them through and show them that, you know, you could have done it this way, it would look much better, you edit it and show them why they need to do that. Then, and it turns out well and they see it on TV, then they get excited. Mm -hmm. They didn't know that they had it in them. You know, because if they have potential, you have to help draw it out mm -hmm. of them. And then they become really excited, you know. So I like to do that. And I think that a lot of people have potential that sits in them and is locked up in them. So you, you have to help draw it out. Emma, I know your baby is the new generation. News generation. News generation. And I know you are so, so passionate about it. I've heard you talk about it, and I can literally feel it come out <laughs> of you. And, you know, I've seen uh, excerpts of it on the TV. Oh, yeah, okay. And it's just wonderful, you know, listening to the children talk about the news in their own way. And as I was telling you off here, that sometimes, you know, even we, the adults, seem to understand that more because it has got no technicalities in it. How did you come about that? Reporting for children telling um, the story from a child's angle or reporting the news, everyday things that happen, whether it's war, conflict, economy, and whatever is going on at the Supreme Court, you know, children want to know about it. And, you know, they also want to know what is going on across the world in their country, how it also affects them, because, you know, children live these stories as well. They're also part of it. If, if their families are not doing well, the economy is not doing well, it still affects them. They will not get pocket money. Why mm -hmm. are they not getting pocket money? You know, mm -hmm. these things. And they also read newspapers, but sometimes they find it difficult to understand some of the issues because it's not actually reported for children. It's not broken down mm -hmm. to a level where they will understand, you know. So, um, Multimedia called me in. They, they have partners, Free Press Unlimited, and said, oh, look, we have this program, so we'd like you to handle it and roll it out for us. It's a news bulletin for children, and Free Press Unlimited actually has duplicated this kind of program children because they like to inform children through mm -hmm. news as well in different countries across the world okay. so that that's how you know it, it, it began and uh, so we started news generation in early January just this year mm -hmm. and um, it's doing quite well we've had a lot of feedback of course and um, the children themselves you never imagine sometimes the things that they can say and also the things that they they believe in and the things that they understand and, you know, from their point of view, sometimes as an adult, you say, okay, you know, they've broken it down in such a simple way that now you understand it. You know, they have opinions as well. Mm -hmm. You know, they, they think like everybody else thinks. Why have we always thought that kids don't want to know about current affairs until they are 25? Because uh, up until I saw the uh, passion coming from them, uh, this girl talking about uh, doom so, doom so, mm. you know, with so much passion. Mm -hmm. And you wonder, I wouldn't have thought that she, at that age she would have been so bothered about it. But it affects them too, doesn't mm -hmm. it? The doom so doom so affects them as well. You know, um, it affects their families, it affects their lives. You know, the, a lot of them told us about the problems they're having because uh, they can't do their homework. You know, when, when they get home it's late and they can't do their homework when there's no electricity. So that is also how it affects them. So they feel everything that goes on, whether it's... Um, let's say rising the uh, minimum wage or whether it's uh, you know a flood here or there they also feel it because you know it, it's part of their lives mm -hmm. so um, why do we always feel that we need to cut them out as you're saying mm -hmm. of some of these things and this is what news generation seeks to do because we, we tell uh, we tell the news we give them the news I mean whether it's local or international and break it down for them to understand what is what is going on across the country or in other parts of the world and they enjoy that and don't forget Anna, the world has become quite a closer place now you know I mean with a lot of technology going on and some mm -hmm. of them do have access to these things and they're very bright children out there whether they they grow up in a slum or they grew up on the other side of the city you know they're, they're children and they're same and, uh, and issues affect them in, in particular ways. Well, Emma, I am getting very excited. We're going to go for a quick break. When we come back, now we're going to delve into her personal life. We want to know <laughs> who's behind all this success. If indeed, is it true that behind every successful woman there should be a man there? 
Oh, it's behind every successful man, there should be a woman. <laughs> you need to find out. And she does this all here by herself, or is there a lucky guy out there somewhere? Stay tuned. We're going to be right back. You're watching PM Express. Hello, welcome back again. And uh, just before one on the break, you know, I was trying to prow into uh, this wonderful lady's private life. And I'm sure as the adverts were rolling, we were also thinking, hmm, who is the lucky guy? So, Emma, who is the lucky guy behind all this success? Hmm. Jesus Christ, of course. Who else can it be? Amen. Who else can it be? I say amen to Hallelujah. That. <laughs> <laughs> now, of course, I've had a lot of support from my family, and um, they support me in everything I do. You know, um, I can. I like to be different, and they just, you know, bear with me and say, "Oh, there she goes again." You know, allow her to do what she wants to do. You know, and that is good support. That's nice. Yeah. Are, are you a, like a independent person, or you're the one that likes to have friends over all the time? No, I don't have friends over all the time because <laughs> in this kind of work we do, you're hardly home. It's true. It's true. <laughs> you know, so I am independent, but I do have very some very close friends that I really, really, you know, enjoy their company and things like that. But I'm I'm also very independent, you know. And um, I, I when people say that if, when they're alone they get bored, I don't understand that. When I'm alone, I never get bored. You Whoa. know. Do you get bored, Nana? Yeah. I easily get bored. Oh, okay. <laughs> I easily get bored. Emma, if you were to invite um, a Ghanaian, one personality, somebody, to dinner, who would it be? A Ghanaian. Oh, um, let me see. It might depend on what I'm cooking that night. I don't know. At the moment, it's not too reserved. That much we know. <laughs> um, maybe... A quad uncle. Was she the was she the presidential candidate? No, or she almost a, made it or she didn't make it, right? No, she couldn't make the uh, registration. Yes. Yes. I'll I'll invite her to dinner. She'll because be a wonderful I, guest. I'd love to sit down and talk to her. She'll be a wonderful guest. I, I would. won't take that I away would. from you. I would. <laughs> <laughs> you you also work with uh, with IDEC. Yes. Yeah. Tell us a bit about that. Um when when I officially left T V three last year, officially um last year September um, Dr. Kwete, who's the executive director of IDEG, you know, said, oh, Emma, you know, come and uh, come and do some work for us. And it was just before the elections anyway. And, you know, IDEG runs situation rooms for elections, and they have observers out there. They're part of a coalition of CFI, which is the um, Civil Forum Initiative. So um, they run a situation room, and they do a lot of, of course, democracy and governance stuff. So I thought, oh, you know, that's, that's interesting. That's a different thing from what I'm used to. But come to think of it, we also engage people. You know, when you're journalists, you also engage people. And they also engage people a lot as well. But of course, on a different level. So I said, OK. You know, so I, I was with IDEG in their situation during the elections. OK. You know, we're working with the police, electoral commission, the political parties, and all that kind of stuff, and other agencies and organizations as well. And then IDEG also has a program which is, um, how should I say, very um, grassroots in the districts and all that and it, it's, it's very close to their heart and um, it's a project where they encourage people to actually um, speak about issues you know issues that affect them in their communities okay. and their districts and how they also can hold leaders accountable for certain things promises as usual that mm -hmm. never come or you know if they want certain things done or they want to understand issues so they also engage the district assemblies a lot on those things so that was re quite exciting as well but that was just for a short time okay <coughs> you won an award uh, TV personality of the year news anchor of the year news editor of the year all in 2010 okay um, not only 2010 but um, news anchor of the year Ages ago, you know, I haven't read news for a number of years now. Okay. And sitting behind this desk actually reminds me of, you know, those days when you sit behind the desk and present the news and all that, or other programs. You miss the director telling you, look into camera one, look into camera two. And telling me off if I'm not doing the right <laughs> thing. <laughs> you know, and he will just say something in your ear and you're like, okay, okay, I beg, I beg. You know, but um, those were quite exciting days. And this was years ago. And also um, with the news editor of the year, that was in 2010. 
um, that was an exciting time. I want to find out which of these awards were very dear to you. In actual fact, it was the news editor of the year, which was really, really dear to me because I, I really didn't expect it one. And um, we, uh, Timothy had gone through a phase of where we had rebranded our news and all that kind of stuff. And actually, we also won um, the program of the year with our mm -hmm. flat, with the with the news program. So. Coming on top of that, it was like, okay, that's really exciting. So I have been recognized for the hard work I have actually done. You know, sometimes when you're doing things, you don't really see, uh, realize that people do see what you're doing it. and appreciate it. You're, you're doing it because that's what you love to you do. And that's it. your work and that's your job. And you enjoy it. You know, so it's, it's good to have some recognition. So that's really dear to my heart. Emma, how are you associated with the CNN I reporters and then uh, BBC World Service? Uh, are you associated with all these guys? It's an it's a, it's a online group community that I, I sort of like joined through LinkedIn, you know, so you, you keep up to date with things going on around the world, you know, issues and discussions that come up. They might be discussing things and you just, you know, click on and add your, your observations and, you know, be part of the discussion online, you know, things like that. So it's always good to read things from, you know, um, people and members in, in such groups because, they, you know, it's interesting. It's not always all about news, but issues, and sometimes people um, asking questions about people in another country, what's going on there, have you heard about this, and all that. Yeah, so that's basically it. Emma, in 200 years from today... 200 years, okay. Posterity would write that one of the most wicked societies that ever came up was the media. Oh. The fourth arm of government, the gatekeepers, who let so <coughs> many people slip through and did not let the country progress. And with all your achievements, even though you were not one of those who probably left the gate open, one bad nut is going to let your mouth taste sour. So yeah. then you and I are all going to be categorized in this category. What can we 200 do? years from now. Yeah, because they'll have to rewrite history. You know, they'll be writing their history and they'll be looking back you know, at a country where uh, we allowed foreigners to come in to poison our waters. We allowed, you know, uh, little kids from the north to come down to the south to do hard work because we wouldn't develop there that enough. And we all stood by and watched, i.e., the fourth arm of government, which is you and I who are in the media. What can you do, not I, you, to make sure that history will not be written that way? Because if we don't change it, that's how history will be written. Hmm. And, ev and everybody says that if there is there, if there's supposed to be change, you know, it has to start from somewhere, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, even one person can make a change and make a difference, sure. you know, but we also need a lot of pe more people to come on board because, you see, all these, um, whether it's young children migrating from the north, coming down and exposed to all sorts of things, you know, it affects everybody. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, it, it affects the fabric of society. It affects, you know, individuals and society at large. So... I'm very passionate about what happens to children. You know, it, sometimes I get really upset even when I see children out on the streets having to sell and all that, or hear stories of how they've been abused. And, and I see, I say there's no fault of theirs. So what do we need to do? Mm -hmm. We can tell their story. But, you know, I keep telling um, um, journalist friends and all that, it's not only about telling the story or reporting about, okay, this has happened here, there's some foreigners who have polluted our water. It's making sure that you tell it in the right way. Mm -hmm. You identify how it should be told, and then you do the follow-up on it until something has been done. You know, because it's it's not over until something has been done concretely. But then, how do you even when something's done, how do you sustain it? You see, you, you have to sort of like um, get the relevant people on board and make sure that you hit hard at it, and even make sure that you know every step of the way. That there's 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 a focus on it, and there's 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 pressure for it to be done and changed, you know. And that's what I can do, and that's what I hope that I'm doing. Yeah, uh, it's very good because uh, sometimes that is why fame is good. Because when you have fame, you know, you get a little more ears who will listen to you. Why did, why why has the media? All the time, but sometimes it's like you're hitting your head against a brick wall. You know, when you want something done, you know, that sometimes. You feel as if um, barriers all of a sudden come up, you know, and you wonder how do you how do you breach these barriers? Um, how how do you make sure that um, your voice is heard or what you want to you know put across is 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 heard or or the same? How do we knock down those those um, solid walls that come up? You know, so I think about that as well.
Well, I mean, at the moment you're the news editor, mm. so you sort of control how much news will go and how much we have to keep the gates to make sure that uh, all the checks and balances are in place. Mm. Before I go there, you're a woman, and mm. it's difficult even in the advanced world to attain the same status as men in society, even in the likes of the Americas and the, you know, the, uh, the UKs. But here you are in Ghana, and you are out there with the boys producing results. What is the trick so that little or young ladies watching will know that, you know what, there's no limitation whether I'm a woman or not, I can also make it. You have to want to make a difference or make a change or achieve something in the first place because if you don't, you, you're not going to get anything done. You know, then you have to persist. There has to be a kind of focus. You should know where you're going and what you want done. Because um, I kept saying that when I worked in the newsroom as just a reporter and an anchor at that time, I had to keep um, proving myself over and over again, you know, that I could do this job and I can make a change and I can, you know, do it better than the boys were doing, sort of thing. And, it, and for me as a woman, I had to do it over and over and over again. But I, at least eventually they did recognize what I can do. So um, what, I, what I'll tell the young ladies out there is that you have to persist, you have to focus on what, you know, you believe in and what you want to achieve because nothing is impossible. So long as you can, you know, you can dream it, you can do it. And um, if you know where you're going exactly, you know how to get there. Well, you, you try and chart a path mm -hmm. and see which way you can go. But they have to persist. You know, it's, it's not going to come easy. easy. You know, it's going to be difficult. Sometimes it can be easy, but you know, it's not all the time that you want to take the easy way out. <laughs> <laughs> or you can't take the easy way out, you know. So they just have to persist. Emma, in your field of work, when you first entered, uh, did you come into it thinking, oh yeah, I want to be a newscaster, give me what the story says and let me read it? Or did you come in to say, no, I need to report stories to actually make a change in society? So, I mean, did you come in with that perception or did you grow into trying to actually make a change in society? You know, when, when I first thought about being a journalist, I just questioned myself, said, why did I want to be a journalist? What do I want to do? Why do I want to do it? Why? You know, I asked these questions of myself, and, I, and I, at first I just said, oh, because I want to do it. But why do I want to do it? You know, what do I want to achieve with it? I didn't go into it thinking that I wanted to be a newscaster. That was just added on, you know, as, as you know, something else. I, I always say that I just do newscasting on the side, you know. But my, my, my main aim was to, to write stories that people could identify with and to be part of and to feel it, not, not, be, not write stories that people couldn't identify with and it was so f they felt so, um, how should I say, detached from, then what are you trying to achieve, you know? I didn't come into this work thinking I'm going to be a newscaster, but then it, it had it added benefits because then it made me read more, you know, it made me think more, it made me do more um, in-depth uh, research because when you're a newscaster too, you can't just go and sit there. You have, to, you have to learn, basically, mm -hmm. and you have to do a lot of research to understand issues better. So I think that I also enhanced my uh, reporting skills as well. You know, so um, first and foremost, I wanted to make sure that I was reporting stories that people could identify with and be part of, and that was not out of reach to them. Well, I also did a little research, and then I find out that you have two categories of admirers. <laughs> the uh, ones that want to marry you instantly, <laughs> and the ones that think, oh, that story you did was just fantastic. They're both welcome. <laughs> you know, I mean, they're both welcome. I don't think they're all, you know, they're both welcome. But how do you deal with it? Because I can imagine how many men out there would want to marry you instantly. Oh, really? I didn't know and that. And I can imagine how many people <laughs> would come to you to say, you know, because of the story you did, we now have light or we now have water. I mean, how do you handle all these? That is really nice, isn't it? I mean, I mean, when you do a story that has impact, has had impact or some kind of effect, that is really, really good. And I used to tell my reporters all the time that, you know, you're not just doing the story. You want to achieve something. Mm -hmm. You know, have that in mind. Why are you doing it? You want to achieve something. Now, for all the men that you say want to marry me, I don't know about that. But, um, Jesus Christ has already got her. Forget it. I, I, I didn't know about that. But um, I, I had a lot of feedback um, from the stories that I did. Mm -hmm. And then it, it made me aware that people are watching. 
and um, listening, you know, and um, feel, um, how should I say, your story had had some kind of impact and they understood what you were trying to put across. Um, I still get a lot of, um, um, how should I say, people asking me, oh, yes, I remember when you went to Liberia and you did those stories from there. And this was years ago, you know, and it was just just at the time that um, Liberia had come out of the war and they were going through the elections and all that kind of stuff. And so there were many issues in that country. Mm -hmm. And I must say, I really enjoyed being there because, you see, um, it was different from what I had experienced in Ghana because I, I worked on the foreign desk. I headed the foreign desk and I did do a bit of travel. You're talking around. about war torn Liberia. Yes. You didn't miss the luxury, you know, because obviously you left a luxury or relatively peaceful country, now in a war torn country where I'm sure everything will have to be compromised this and compromised that. Did you not miss? Mm. We went in, um, well, after the war was over. Okay. But I'm sure I'd have enjoyed the war. Not enjoyed it as, you know, had a great laugh about it. Mm. But, you know, the experience is itself, the, you know, you, you sort of grow when you, you um, um, how should I say it, when you experience different things. You know, you, you grow. I mean, you, you can't be in the same position or the same place because you, you can't experience anything. Mm -hmm. So I think um, experiencing war and you know conflict would also ma have made me a better person to understand certain things better so we went in after the war okay. when the UN was there and um, but there were still the effects of the war were so uh, how should I, um, obvious it was everywhere down to the orphaned children you know so many orphanages were children who um, were so traumatized that they couldn't speak you know because wow. they'd seen so many atrocities to people still agitating for change, to demonstrations, because I always tell people that one day we were in, in the capital, Monrovia, and um, all of a sudden we saw people running in one direction, and we were, where, where are they going? We asked them, and they said, oh, you know, they were running out to the city. So, of course, we went the other way to see what was going on. And there was riot, riot police were everywhere, marching down the street to quell a demonstration, and then, of course, there were UN soldiers, and they said to us, you know, you can't be in the midst of them because you never know what will happen. Yeah. If something happens right now, you can't. So they asked us to sort of like go to the side. But what did we do as journalists? At that time, we're not thinking about our safety, are you we? Want to be there and oh, we, went, we the jumped news. into the middle <laughs> and, you know, and we were with them and it was so exciting, you know. But sometimes you do certain things and afterwards you think, gosh, why did I do this? You was know, that the highlight of your career? Would you say it was the highlight or there was a more events? Oh, lots of stuff happened, <laughs> you know, I mean, it, but it was part of the hi uh, highlight of, you know, my career because I, I like to experience different things. And you did you know. your master's in post-war you know, media. I actually, yes, I did do so, my dissertation for yeah. my master's in, um, in, actually I did it in Sierra Leone mm -hmm. because I was looking at um, post-conflict media, mm -hmm. you know, how, how a media... Uh, the media would survive or how are they surviving in a post-conflict situation. And at that time, Sierra Leone also had come out of the war for two years. Mm -hmm. So there were issues, you know, because people didn't have money, they were broke, you know, I mean, um, journalists, you know, had to make money somehow, you know, so sometimes they would just throw their credibility to the dogs, you know, and do what the politicians wanted them to do. But they knew that they were not doing the right thing. Oh. But then how does the media help in reconstructing a country like Sierra Leone that had gone through this massive war, infrastructure, the effects of it, you know, the war on the people themselves, you know, and their spirit and the whole country, you know, what was the role of the media in actually re helping to reconstruct such a country? And that's what I did my dissertation in, my well, master's dissertation in, yeah. Well, you, were, you must have been living your dream then. Now, <laughs> there you are, and I need you to talk. Along the screen, I need you to tell us... Uh, about these pictures? Oh, this, this one, that, that picture at that time, um, you could see me in the blue helmet, yes. right? And I was sort of touching a gun. Uh -huh. They never let me fire that gun, I must say. <laughs> but that was the first time um, UN, how should I say it, female Ghanaian peacekeepers had actually gone on a mission. Okay, so, so what country was that? This, this was Liberia. This is Liberia. Yes. Well, that's you there, you yeah. know, with your gun. Yeah, and the, the lady next to me was the commander then. And I said, well, so you command this battalion, you know, what are you doing? How exciting is that? And, and that's you in the salon. 
Oh, actually, that was the uh, wardrobe getting ready to read the news or something. Okay. <laughs> how, how many years ago was this? Oh, gosh. I can't remember. It must have been a few years back, maybe about five years. So that's the issue you're doing, doing what you do best. I was working. I was thinking and thinking of a story, Ooh, story ideas, storylines. What do I do with this, you know, sort of thing. Yeah. And that's you and your, and your friend? Oh, they are Gideon. You know, I know there was rumors that, you know, you guys were dating. I heard those. Yeah. I heard about that. But, of course, they're not true. Because Gideon and I are quite close friends. We're more like brother and sister, really. Lovely scene. Holiday or working? No, it was work. This was Sharm El Sheikh um, in um, Egypt. Okay. And there was a forum going on there, an African forum, and, you know, we were reporting. But um, I love the scene behind um, me. And this picture here? This picture was when uh, we were on a, a leadership program in the U.S. They chose 100 women from around the world, 20 women from Africa, I mean, 20 women from all the continents, so okay. we made 100. So this was one you lady made from... It? Yes, I made it. Surprisingly, I was just there, and they called me up and said, well, well, we want you on this program. That looks like London. Uh, yes. No, Germany. Just Germany. Yeah, and um, they were going to do their elections at that time. Oh, so you're there to monitor? Yes. Oh, that's good. Yeah. That's good. Well, you, you have been around. Yeah, that's Germany. Still in too. Germany? Or yeah. Still in Germany? Yeah. yeah. Still monitoring elections? Yes. Gosh, where did they get these pictures? <laughs> <laughs> where did they get these pictures? <laughs> well, we, we're all enjoying it. Oh, that's Gideon. And that's okay, your yeah. Night or? Yeah, yeah. Um, I think this was when Mike Lason launched his foundation. You know, he launched a foundation. And okay. Then, yeah. So he, he did a few things in some of rural areas and where he came from as well. Liberia or what's that? This was actually South Africa. We went for the World Cup draw. Okay. Yeah. And um, hmm, it was interesting. Okay, yes. And this is South Africa, um, Cape Town, where they did actually the World Cup draw. So you can see behind all those footballs. footballs. Yes. At that time. Yeah. Well, you have been I around. I thought I'll take some pictures with the footballs. You see? There's you there, you know, having a little pose well, and doing your reporting. that was the stadium. You know the huge stadium in um, South Africa, the one that they used for the World Cup? Uh -huh. I was in there. So I decided <laughs> to, to relax on the grass. Oh, no, and, yeah. and do your reporting. Yeah. Uh, that's you still reporting. Yeah, and that was in front of Mandela's house. Um, quite a popular place to be. Okay. Mm. Have you met Mandela? I haven't. I haven't. I'd haven't. love to meet him, though. And this was uh, South African telling us about um, issues in his country. Okay. And just before the World Cup, mm, okay. what they expect. Yeah. Well, I mean, you've had an eventful career. You have an eventful career, and I'm thinking, you know, it hasn't all come by chance. So I like it when you tell, you know, the youth to persist. Because I didn't think they just said, oh, yeah, she's pretty. Hope you're on the plane. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> we're going to go for a break, and when we come back, we're going to continue our conversation. I am so enjoying this. Stay tuned. We're going to be right back. Hello, you're watching PM Express, and we are talking to the Emma Morrison, uh, a media dynamo. Emma, what's that one thing that you think you haven't done? Maybe not necessarily in media, maybe in your personal life, uh, something that you think I should have, I, should, I could do and haven't done, or something that you dreamed, you know, in a few years' time, I should be able to do this. Is there something? Mm. Um, have a charity, you know. I mean, that's something I, I'd love to have, to help young people, you know, children, to achieve their dreams and what they, the, the potential in them, unlock the potential in them to achieve what they want to achieve. You know, and also because, uh, you know, I keep saying that I, I feel so bad when I see young children out on the streets being abused and all that kind of stuff. What, what can I do to help them, you see? And I also feel that um, there's a lot that I have to do, and I feel that I need to teach people. My mother, when I was growing up, my mother always thought I would be a lecturer in some university or something. You like, are. This is like you're lecturing the whole world. <laughs> <laughs> I really didn't see myself as a lecturer in a, in a lecture hall or anything mm -hmm. like that. But she said, oh, you know, you do a good job, you know. And so when I say to teach people, not to go and stand in lecture hall to teach, <laughs> but to teach people about um, media and how they can actually report the things that they need to report and how they can report it in a, in a more exciting and innovative way, 
you know, for people to feel it and see it and for them to be part of it. Um, I like that charity because sometimes, you know, you ask for that one thing and you get Rolls Royce, you get a big house, you get uh, something more materialistic. It's very warm that you want to set up a charity for mm. children mm. to help them to achieve. Mm. That's beautiful. Emma, the media, when you first came in 16 years ago and the media today, what's the major difference that you, you, you've noticed? The major difference is the technology. <laughs> 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 Absolutely. You know, I love technology. I mean, you know, what can you use technology to achieve is, is good. That has changed. Mm. And also, I think um, the landscape has um, opened up more. You technology, know. do you think has made the media job... Uh, I don't want to use irrelevant. Relevance is too strong. But <coughs> are they taking a chunk of what the media could have done? Because you go to your Facebook wall and... You know, the pink sheet said this yeah. and the pink sheet and said that. There. So before even the 12 o'clock news comes, you know that there's a missing pink sheet somewhere. Mm. Has it taken, you know, some of our, our work or...? Well, I suppose it has. You know, when I, I went to this um, forum called, called the News Exchange where all the big news organizations were there and all that. And they had this debate, traditional media versus social media, you mm -hmm. know, which is really, really on the ball. And it turned out everybody voted for the traditional media. Because, you see, even though you have the social media, people putting out information there and all that, is it the right information? You know, is, is it, is it um, communicated properly? You know, do you, is it governed by certain ethics? You know, so the traditional media won, you know. And, and, but now, you see, what, uh, what technology has done is actually opened up the space to include what we call citizen journalists, you know. Mm -hmm. And so it's so difficult to control information now. Um, but um, it's already out there. Let me digress a little bit, then we come back. And you and the media. Somebody would broadcast something in English, and he could have the BNI at his door. Mm -hmm. If the same guy broadcasts it in tree, he will get an award. Why? If you listen to a tree broadcast and they are reporting about a child that was raped, yes, the way the presenter will go about it, the descriptions, the this, the that, the pain, the agony, the air, the, 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 you know, and I, I dare not say it in English. If I, if I reported the same story in the same way in English, I'll be condemned. If I do the same way in tree, we would award the People person. see it like it's exciting, isn't because it? Because we've seen, you know, three newscasters who have won awards. I'm not saying they've done anything bad, but there are certain reports, and in the way in which they say it, it's accepted and awarded. But in English, it would be it absolutely... Would not be. So why do we do that? You know, funny, funny you should ask me this question, because just this afternoon, I was sitting in a taxi, and there was this um, three um, newscast going mm -hmm. on. I had parked my car somewhere, and I said, let me get a taxi, and, you know, and... On the radio, there was a bulletin going on, reporting about rape and how it was done and the effects and all that. And I said, oh. And so the taxi driver said, oh, yeah. Sa no more, yeah. Say, yeah, no more, can we news, no? At this time, this time, what, yeah, say, say. And I said, wow. You know, but it was too raw. It was, why, it was, why do we it was accept it? And then we wouldn't accept it if it was the same thing was done in English. I'm not sure I can answer your question. Um, but I remember that, um, for instance, the GJ has kicked against that, you know, because, you see, it, it makes reporting something very serious look very trivial, or mm -hmm. it turns it into some kind of entertainment. Mm -hmm. But it's a serious issue, you know. And, you know, there have been people who have said that we cannot have that. You know, you, you have to report it as it is straight. Don't add anything to it. Don't take anything out of it, you know, so that people understand the seriousness of it, but I think that they felt there's a need to sort of liven it up, you know, for, to to actually grab more listeners, for listeners to be to want to listen to them all the time. But it 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 takes something away from the seriousness of the story, and that is very very dangerous. Well, before we go on, I have a surprise for you. Mm. Yeah, so let's just all look on the screen.